Thank you very much for coming to Webinar Wednesday tonight. I greatly appreciate it. I always love doing webinars, so let's get it going here. So tonight we're going to talk about web design and redesign in 2019. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. David Wank, and I am a practicing general dentist in New York City, and I am the president of Short Hills Design, which is a web development and internet marketing firm for dentists and physicians. Here's my contact information. I will, of course, leave that for you at the end if you need it. Okay, so what we're going to do about tonight is we're going to talk about an introduction. We're going to briefly look at the web design workbook for dentists and the workflow. I want to talk about building your site. We're not really getting it into driving traffic and converting patients, but I want you to get kind of a glimpse from each section of the, uh, the web design workflow about where, what you have to think about when you're building your new website. I want you to know what you have to be thinking about. I think that's, that's really the most important thing that you're building. You're going to have to think, well, what do, what do I have to look at moving forward? So I'd like to thank Mark uh, Dykeman at Esteto Dental Labs. So Esteto is a full service laboratory in Maplewood, New Jersey. And Mark and his team, they offer hundreds of CE programs throughout the year, especially if you're in New Jersey, uh, you can't miss it. They're inexpensive and they're fantastic. And I urge you to call Mark. You can find him at estetto.com, and I have the phone number up there for you. But again, whether you're going to try out a lab, they have some great specials, especially if you want to try out a new lab. I know that I like trying out a new lab sometimes just to mix it up a little bit and see what we can do. So thanks again to Mark. And thank you again to Estetto. Estetto is um, providing the CE credits for tonight, and that is fantastic. I appreciate that, too. And again, we'll email you or we'll mail you your certificate. And if you have any problem getting your certificate, uh, please email me, and I will take care of it for you. Okay, introduction. So first of all, whoa, the slide's a little bigger than I expected. So uh, the internet marketing for healthcare providers, I'd love you to join the group. It is a private group on Facebook, just dentists, doctors, chiropractors, podiatrists, healthcare providers, where we talk about internet marketing, things that affect all of us. It is free to join, and there's about 250, 260 of us now, also, your team members are welcome to join as well. So we'd love to have you. And we really have only you know, a handful of marketers who I know personally who contribute to the conversation. It's not trying to spam you with things. And I apologize for this big slide. I wrote this in Keynote and converted it to PowerPoint. And now we know there are some limitations with fonts that I didn't expect. Technical level. So there really is no technical level. Nothing here is technical. It's designed that way. Um, you could use this as a guide when you are building your website to go back to. and again to know how, how to guide if you have any questions please just ask uh, there is a raise your hand button that you can push you should see that on the bottom of your screen uh, towards the middle it says chat raise hand qa under chat you can find that and again taking notes those of you who have been to webinar wednesday before know i'm not a big note taker uh, certainly write anything down you'd like if there's something you have to know i will absolutely tell you but email me if you'd like a copy of the slides i'm happy to give them to you yeah, just email me and I will take care of those for you. So the web design workbook for dentists, let's talk about it. So it is a non-technical guide for dentists and dental team members. It's not a do-it-yourself book, but it's what you need to know before you invest in a website or search engine optimization campaign. Uh, it's at webdesignworkbook.com and it is 100% free. Again, sorry that didn't line up. I blame PowerPoint. All right, so let's talk about the web design workflow. Now, I want you to understand this when you're building your website because the structure ahead of time makes a difference. It's like taking an impression for a crown. If you do not have a great prep, I forget who told me, but it changed the way I, I did crown and bridge. And someone said to me, if you, and it seems obvious now, if you can't see the margins of the preparation before you take your impression, you're not gonna get a good impression. And I was surprised, but again, that actually makes a lot of sense. So. Step one is initial website planning, development, and setup, and building a website to Google standards. That is the most important thing. Second thing is driving traffic, whether it's search engine optimization, pay-per-click, social media, doesn't matter. Phase three is analytics, tracking, conversion optimization, and phase four is maintenance and backups. But again, while you're building your site, you don't have to understand all of these. I want you thinking ahead. I want you thinking that if I don't you know, have enough clearance, if I don't reduce enough, the crown's gonna come back with metal on the occlusal. And I certainly know that that's gonna happen, so I might as well reduce enough now. 
as opposed to reducing it, re-impressing it, or explaining to the patient why you know, you've got metal on the biting surface of your tooth. All right, phase one, building your website. These are key if you fall asleep right now after the presentation, because you do have to stay for the full hour to get the CE, and the system here tracks you, I apologize. Only tracks you now, it doesn't track you once you leave. We just have to make sure that you are here for auditing. Uh, for those of you who have been on Dentaltown recently, there was a huge thread about a domain that the company owned it and someone purchased the website from the new practice. You must own the domain. Absolutely. That's number one. So www.whatever it is, own the domain. If you buy a practice, get them to transfer the domain over because nobody cares that you own the domain. You know, whether it's register.com or GoDaddy, they don't care unless you are on the list, you are you know, registered as the, as the owner. You own the Google account. Again, you should have an analytics account, webmaster tools account, maybe an AdWords account uh, or a Facebook uh, account, those kind of things. You have to own that. For our clients, we settle those accounts up and we're administrators, but our clients own the accounts. So they could turn us on and turn us off anytime they'd like. Same thing for any of your social sites, especially Facebook. Facebook, as confusing as Facebook ads interface is, I don't like it. Um, what I will tell you is that, even though those ads can be effective, they certainly can, what I will tell you is that there are a lot of permission levels available, so it's really good because you can prevent someone from owning your business for you on Facebook, it gives them permission to help you. You own the content. Uh, sometimes you get a website that's built and the content just comes there, but you don't own that. Um, I would see if you own the content or at least the license for it. For our websites, when, you know, our websites come with 15 pages or 25 pages, depending on the package from uh, our website, from our, our company, actually, Content Dentist. Um, and so what happens is the clients get content from contentdentist.com and they own the license for that content on their website. So if they leave Short Hills or they don't want to work with us after because they have a, you know, their brother or their nephew does web work for them and we just built it, it's theirs, they have the license. You own the stock image. Uh, our clients spend around 65 to $75 on stock images once. So please don't skimp on stock images. You don't want to get a $3,000 bill from Getty Images saying that you violated copyright because you don't have a license for that image. So please make sure. And the answer is my webmaster, you know, my web developer did it for me. It's not a good answer. They don't care. So make sure you have a license. What we do is we help our clients set up an iStock photo account or whatever you know, photo you want to use, whatever service, and we help them populate what they want in the account or we'll populate it for them and they can go in and make the purchase. That way they own the license. You own the theme. So 95% of the websites we build now are custom themes. But again, you own the license for the custom theme that we do. Uh, if you are using a theme, let's say from Theme Forest or somewhere else, or Genesis, I happen to love Genesis for small satellite office sites, that if you use Genesis, you need to own a license for Genesis and a license for the theme, which will run you, you know, $99 for life or $129 total, something like that. So don't skimp on that. And you have the backups. Uh, I could tell you horror stories, but I won't. You've got to have a backup of your website, even if it's on a proprietary system and you can't actually pull a backup, make, make copies of the web pages or print out, take one day when, you're, when, when there's a no-show and have your staff, even the simplest thing, just file print out the web pages. They might not print the right way, but at least you will have a semblance of what it was. Ideally, you should have a backup. If you're using WordPress, there's a program called Backup Buddy by iThemes.com that we require our clients purchase and we set it up for them. So they always own their backups. And I want to say it runs around $80 a year. So it's certainly a steal to have your backups. All right. Use WordPress, please. Uh, I'm not going to get into content management systems, but the days of having a website that you can't edit yourself are kind of gone. If you want to be able to edit your website yourself, you should be able to. And if you don't, that's fine too. WordPress is a, just like Microsoft Word is a program that lets you write documents and Excel does spreadsheet sheets, excuse me. WordPress is blogging software that lives online and, you know, a company like ours will build you the website and then you're able to edit it. And the beauty of WordPress is that if you work with company one and then want to switch to company two and then back to company one or have third party four to work with you, it's totally fine. With us, for example, 
we are flexible. And I think we're one of the few companies that allow you to kind of do whatever you want. If you would like to, you know, once we build a site for you, you are done. And if you'd like to stick on with us and have us do updates for you, fantastic. If you'd like to do them yourself, fantastic. You want to work with us for AdWords and Facebook ads? Fantastic. You want to work with someone else? Fantastic. But WordPress really gives you the ability to do that. There are plenty of situations where we have clients where we'll do structural maintenance or content maintenance, but they use someone you know, local in their neighborhood to help them with some marketing. And certainly, you know, WordPress gives everyone the ability to do that and the freedom to move around if you'd like. Build your website to Google's Webmaster Standards. Now, I hate to say because Google said so, but more and more, it's because Google said so. And we're going to see that later on. There are some ranking factors that don't really make sense as far as I'm concerned, such as SSL. But if Google said what we have to do, then unfortunately, it's something that we have to do. Now, when it comes to ranking factors, what I'm talking about is what factors make your website rank in a search engine listing. For example, you know, dentist uh, Tribeca, New York. How does Google decide? Now, that's an SEO webinar. And there are a bunch of them I already have online about that. You can email me if you want me to send you the one it is. They're on YouTube and they're on our website. But if you look here, here's a broad overview of some of the ranking factors. We can look here, page speed, uh, your title tags, are you mobile ready? How much content do you have? How many reviews do you have? So what kind of reviews? So these are the ranking factors and we have a pretty good idea um, and again, it's not a secret. I don't have a special relationship with Google. No one you're going to deal with has a special relationship. Uh, but what we don't know is, and this is all available out there, the same way that if you want to learn how to build your own computer, I know how to build my own computer, but I don't, I don't have any, any deal with, you know, Apple or Dell or anything like that. I learned how to do it. And you can too. Um, so this is not a secret. It's not a mystery. Um, it's just, you know, you know, do you do your own accounting? You can, but, you know, so what we don't know with the relative weights. Now, these I made up. These are not actual relative weights. Um, but I want to show you here, for example, mobile ready. It might be more important that your website is mobile ready than if your server is located in the country and where you have your website. Your, uh, whether you have alt tags on your images, which we'll talk about in a minute, is that more important than your page speed? And the truth is we don't know. Remember that when you're competing, you are competing against your peers, thankfully. You are not competing against, um, for example, Coca-Cola or Apple or some massive company. If you are you know, Dr. Wang's dental office, you're competing against you know, Dr. A, Dr. B, and Dr. C. And so Google's going to look, and let's say they want to say, you know, um, dentist my area. And there's Dr. A, Dr. B, Dr. C, and me, Dr. W. Google's going to look at these and say, well, who's got what? So I might have a really fast website with really poor content. And Dr. B might have a really fast, oh, I have it twice, a really fast website that's responsive, but no SSL. Dr. C might have great keywords, and, but his server is located in Canada and he's you know, a US dentist and he hasn't filled out his profile. So we don't really know what the relative weights are and it changes. So there's really no point to kind of guess the algorithm is why we tell everybody, you know, build everything to standards, just like making a crown. You can certainly get away if it's a little short or if you have a little bit of an undercut, you can certainly get away with it and you'll be fine. But if you can know ahead of time you have an undercut, prevent it and, and do it the right way. So what we try and do is instead of going back and say, oh my goodness, you want to rank for implants and you don't, well, your page speed is off or you don't have SSL or you have bad reviews or whatever it happens to be, I'd rather when you set up your website in the beginning, you do it right the first time. So use responsive design. Responsive design is pretty clear from this picture. We do not have separate websites for mobile or tablet or whatever that may be. Responsive design basically means that you have a website that folds to fit in the space of the thing that you're using, whether it's an iPhone, a tablet, laptop. Uh, I almost think of it like a liquid. When I lecture, I, when I lecture, I take a big napkin, one of those, you know, table napkins and fold it and say, look, it's still the same website. It just looks a little different. So here you can see, um, here you've got this whole responsive web design title here with these icons, but here they shrunk them down. And they, obviously you can't put this side by side here. It won't fit. And, you know, web design becomes smaller. So it's really 
very similar, but you're adjusting things for the mobile environment or the tablet environment. Think of it as a liquid that fits in the container, as we remember from chemistry. So you kind of want to think of it that way. Now, I want you to use standards. So you, if, if you are building an art website or something like that, you can go crazy and do whatever you want and put navigation where it doesn't belong. But when it comes to your, your dental website, make sure you follow standards. And so, for example, you've got a logo here, and this is a made up website. Logo top left that when you click it, it goes to the homepage, home about services. You know, the reason that we do navigation like this is because this is how it's been, and these are the standards. Um, I didn't necessarily write the standards, no one asked me, but this is how the standards are. Maybe they will one day. But obviously, home about us, you don't want the blog over here on the left. Home shouldn't be here. Context should be on the right. Again, these are just standards. Social icons show trust. Uh, the, my favorite lecture and webinar that I give is social media for dentists who hate social media. That's my favorite. But you've got to have it for trust. And I'm not going to talk about trust now. It's not this webinar. But understand that you've got to show patients that they can trust you. Part of that is, is you wear a white coat. You have a clean office. You have a friendly staff. They don't know. Why do you think, why are you willing to pay $70 for a steak at a steakhouse, but not $70 for a hamburger at Burger King? Um, you know, if they dressed up at Burger King like they dress up at the steakhouse, maybe you would pay that. So again, it is about, patients can't look at your x-rays and know what your crowns look like, even though they ask us and they say, can I see that x-ray? Certainly, they do <laughs> all the time. But, you know, you've, you've got to do everything you can to show them that you are trustworthy because you certainly can't ask, they, 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 you can't teach them dentistry and show them. Uh, and make sure you have a clickable phone number. And so I put a picture of the supermarket here because every supermarket you go to, you're going to find things are pretty much in the same place. I think that maybe you should put things in alphabetical order in my you know, hypothetical supermarket, but people would get confused. And it might be a great idea, but if people go to my supermarket and they're, not, and they're confused about where things are, they're not going to want to stay. Same thing if you're at a traffic light and it turns and the bottom third circle turns red, but that's usually where the green is. Do you stop or do you go? I mean, if you have a green stop sign, do you stop or do you go? So, you know, we have these standards for a reason and these kind of standards make people comfortable. So I would stick with them. Do not be edgy on your, um, you know, when it comes to navigation and things like that. Remember, not everyone knows the computer as well as you do. There are still people who will go to, um, you know, a search engine will go to Google or MSN and type in MSN or type in Google or type in AOL to get to AOL. I mean, people are not always as computer savvy as we think they are. So understand that. Please make it easy to get in touch. You know, on your iPhone, your Android, whatever it happens to be, make sure your phone number is clickable. That's one of the easiest things you can do that you could screw up really easily. And it should be a phone number, not a number. So yeah, we'll get them done during the day, but number to call. Think about colors. Really, 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 colors really make a huge difference. Now, obviously in the United States, uh, in our culture, things mean different than they do, for example, in Asian cultures or in certain European cultures. So make that work for your demographic. Generally speaking, we don't want to use red on a dental website because red is blood. Uh, I like if you want to highlight, maybe you could use red to highlight that when you're filling out a form and there's a mistake, you know, please fill in your proper email or this field can't be blank, but think about color. And remember, you know, color has meaning. So you're not going to want to do like a dark, you know, this, this dark maroon, I don't know how it shows on your screen, or a very light color like this with, with no contrast. You have to think about that. So again, the color should you know, reflect your office colors, but you don't want a jet black website because that, you know, that might not be friendly. Again, it's, it's what your colors are, but, but think about how you use color. Okay, use appropriate images. All the images I have here are appropriate. These are, and they're legal. Make sure, as I said earlier, that any image you have on your website is legal, meaning you own the license. So. You know, here are appropriate images, um, the partials, whatnot. Here's a partial. Here's a picture of a crown. Here's an easy picture of attrition. And so what you would do here is you can use these, you can label them. But notice how there's no um, prep teeth here. Notice how there's, this is also, there's no bloody socket there or anything like that. 
keep it like that, please. If you're going to show you know, a, a video of you doing a surgery, no problem. But put a, put a warning that says, hi, you know, the, the image below is of Dr. Wank doing surgery. Please understand this says, you know, graphic images or graphic content matter that might make you want to you know, lose your lunch. So just make sure you know that ahead of time. That's okay. But don't surprise people with images that they are not used to seeing. Use alt tags. So what an alt tag does, and your web developer should know this, an alt tag describes an image for a search engine. Your search engine, now, I, I always use this image, and I say to people in the audience, what is that a picture of? And they say, oh, it's a dog, okay? It's a Westie, it's a Westie wearing sunglasses, it's denim, it's a pooch sitting down, it's... So the problem is you and I might not know, it, might know what it is, we might disagree. Uh, we might be running a sunglasses story that say, our sunglasses are so cool that dogs wear them. Or our denim is so cool in our clothing store that dogs wear them. Or this could be a dog website, pamper your dog. You know, our dog food is so good, he'll feel just like he's pampered. There's no way for Google to know what our intention is on that image. So for these images as well, if I'm teaching you uh, about, you know, this is a lecture about partial denture design, I might say, oh, well, you know, here's the, you know, the main, the major connector, and this might be a picture of a, you know, a lingual bar major connector. But if it's for patients, I'm going to say removable partial denture. Why? Because on this page, I'm going to put this on the dental website that says removable partial denture. Are, those are dentures where you take them in and out at night and blah, 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 blah. And here's an RPD, removable partial denture, that supports the page. Same thing with dental crown. You can certainly say, if this were a, an, an image for me teaching students, I would say, you do not want to have a crown prep that's round at the top like that, that looks like that. That's not what it's supposed to look like. Um, however, if you're doing it for patients who it's not an issue, you could just say dental crown. So what the alt tags do is they help reinforce what the image is. But think of this dog. Is, is this for, a, you know, pampering your dog? Is it for sunglasses, denim, or dog training because he's sitting down? So again, think about those things and all of your images should have alt tags. And the other reason is because for people who are using screen readers or who have assisted devices, uh, these alt tags tell people what the image is and, and what they're seeing. Keep your image sizes small. So when we talk about x-rays, you want to minimize the x-rays, obviously, you know, as low as reasonably allowed or allowable, I think. Um, lower than 30 to, you know, less than 30 to 50 kilobytes um, on your image sizes. And again, your web developer knows that if you're curious, most people don't want to know what that is or how that works, but if you're curious, email me or ask me on the Facebook group and I will, I will let you know what that means. But what happens is, is sometimes a staff member of yours will upload an image that is a meg. And to put that into perspective, that is 20 times the size you know, of a 50K image, which takes forever to load, which brings me to my next point, that page speed is a ranking factor. We saw that list before of ranking factors. So what Google wants to say is, hey, we want the website with the best user experience to show first. So if you're looking for Dentist Tribeca, remember we talked about that, that page with all those ranking factors, which one is gonna give our, the visitors the best experience? Because if Google sends them to a website that takes three minutes to load and is in Flash and doesn't work on their phone, by the way, never use Flash anymore, please. On their phone, you're gonna say Google stinks, so I'm gonna use a different search engine. So page speed matters because people don't wanna wait online literally and figuratively. And one of the ways that Google differentiates you is how fast your page loads. And the faster a page loads, the, the better the experience is. So that's a ranking factor. And the biggest thing that slows down pages is images. And on the web these days, you don't need to have massive images. You know, I, I had a, um, well here, you could, you could still take a, uh, I have an old DSLR from 2006 or 2007 that takes pictures at 10 megapixels. Uh, the new one takes them like at 18 megapixels. And you know what? I never ever print a full size banner of my kids playing baseball or anything like that. So I don't need more than 10 megapixels. I really don't. And I don't need video in, so in, in my DSLR. So certainly, you know, you, you don't need to have images that are huge to get the point across for the screen. So you want to be, some people will tell you, you know, one and a half seconds, two seconds, that's pushing it a little bit, but under three to three and a half seconds really makes sense. And again, you're competing against your colleagues. You're not competing against, you know, Microsoft uh, with engineers. You're competing against other dental websites. 
content is king. Well, one thing that hasn't changed in six years or 10 years now or forever is that content is king. So, so much so that we built a website, I said company before, it's actually a part of Short Hills. Um, we sell content for you to put on your website. Ideally, I want you to write your own content. I say that as the proprietor of content dentist, that I make money when you buy content, I still want you writing your own content. Your own written content is the best content. The second best content is content that you would buy that you would customize. The third best content is content that you purchase. Now, in the past, Google has said that, hey, listen, content that we, that's duplicate. If a dentist in Winnipeg has the same content as a, um, as a dentist in Williamsburg, same implant page, everyone's penalized, forget it. That's not so anymore. If the pages are spammy, loaded with links, and they're terrible like that, then yeah, you'll be penalized. But generally speaking, duplicate content does not incur a penalty. But it pays to customize any content that you get because, you know, as fantastic, you know, I, I am a professional content writer. And, you know, as far as my content goes, as great as it is, it's never as good as the content that you write for yourself. Or at least the content you write for yourself that someone else can at least tweak for you. So along those pit lines, please have a dedicated page for each service. And here's why. If you look at this one on the left, our services, this is implants, root canals, dentures, and extractions. And so I ask you, what is that page about? Compare it to the dental implants page, which is implants topic number one, more about implants, even more about implants. So if someone in your area is doing a search for dental implants, Google's gonna say, well, hmm, which of these pages is the best page for dental implants? Is it the one where dental implants is one of one, two, three, four topics, or the one that's dedicated to implants? And obviously it's the one on the right. So again, these are things you have to think about when you're, bu when you're building your website ahead of time. So is your web page mobile friendly? That's huge. Your page has to be mobile friendly, which means it has to work well on a mobile device, phone, tablet. Google has a very nice test. You go to do a Google search for Google mobile friendly test. I'm only there because I'm logged in as me. Um, when you're there logged in as you, you'll have your picture. But it's a mobile friendly test. You type it in and Google will tell you if you're mobile friendly or not. And it's pass fail. And they're gonna tell you you're friendly, but there are some things you can fix. That's fine. But they don't grade it on a scale. Either you pass it, you don't pass. So that's good. SSL. So let's recognize SSL. SSL is now a ranking factor. And the SSL is this padlock. It says secure. You see it on eBay, Amazon, Gmail. And so I ask you, why does a dental website need to have SSL? And it's a great question. And the answer is because Google said so. Google has this idea that that makes the web more secure. I don't understand that. And I understand computers pretty well. If we're not transacting, we're not doing credit cards, we're not doing anything like that, then I don't see why we need to burden us with SSL as, you know, as small businesses. But look, if you're taking credit cards, certainly, and even if you were, I would not have you take credit cards on your own website. It makes much more sense to have, you know, people expect a secure payment processor. So, um, you know, even with content dentists or even with um, the web design workbook, which is free, but when, when we were charging for it, you, you check out on the website and you're redirected to PayPal or Stripe or another trusted provider that handles the payments and direct it back to the website. So no one expects you really to pay on the website unless, again, your eBay, Amazon, like that. But certainly, I don't know why we need SSL, but Google said so. And what SSL does is it basically scrambles the information to make it private. So here's your computer and you're typing in your password to the bank, one, two, three, four, five. It goes to the bank server and the bank sends you some information back. What SSL does is it makes sure that you type in one, two, three, four, five, it gets encrypted, sent over here, decrypted and understood to log you in. That's, that's all that really SSL does. So again, SSL, because Google said so. So let's take a minute and talk about Google Maps. Google Maps is designed for consumers. So you look for Short Hills Design, it's our old address and it shows you a map. I'm a consumer, I say, oh great, Short Hills Design, blah, 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 fine. Because Google said, hey, you know what? We wanna replace the yellow pages online, so you're gonna, you're gonna be on the map. And what Google did is they basically took every retail place that exists and made a listing for them on the web. And so the other side of Google Maps is Google My Business. And so that's for the businesses. 
And so Google said, hey, Short Hills Design, you know, we have this empty profile for you. So if you fill out this profile, we'll be able to tell your users so much information about you when they search for you or for when you come up. And so, for example, back here, why is all this information here? Because I filled out the location, I filled out the listing 100%. And over here, same thing. So, of course, thanks for uh, sharing my competitors, Google. But the idea is that Google said, hey, listen, doctor, dentist, whoever you are, small business, toy store, restaurant, we're going to reward you, quote unquote, with an extra bit of information next to your listing if you are kind enough to fill it out for us. It works for you, it works for us. So please, please, please fill out your listing 100%. 90% uh, is not filled out, 95% is not filled out, please. You can log into Google My Business and you can certainly go in there and just look and it will tell you it's completely filled out and it is a ranking factor. So if you and I are competitors for that dental implants page and everything on our sites is pretty much you know, where it needs to be, up to par, and your listing is 100% filled and mine isn't, it may make a difference. Similarly, NAP, your name, address, phone number. Google wants to make sure that your name, address, and phone number are consistent across the internet so that are you listed as Dr. David Wank, Dr. David A. Wank, Dr. Wank, you know, Dr. David Wank DMD, Dr. David Wank. It still says DDS some places, even though I'm DMD. So they want to make sure that your name, address, and phone number are consistent across the web. And in theory, in theory, doing so will make your maps listings better. I'm going to show you maps listings in a few minutes. But I use Moz.com, what I tell my clients to use. It's a hundred bucks a year. You lot, you know, you you connect it, and basically it looks at your Google My Business listing, and then it helps you make sure that something like the top 10 directories, so to speak, on the web have consistent listings. You don't need to submit it to a thousand different directories because it trickles down. Let's say Google has Google My Business and Facebook, you can verify through Facebook also. Once they've done the verifying, then these other listings, you know, um, Squarespace and, um, not, not Squarespace, but uh, what is it, like Yellow Pages and all of these other kind of directory listings, not White Pages, or a bunch of others. I mean, I don't even know because I don't even check because the truth is Moz takes care of it for me. But it makes sure if you had to do a card verification for every single directory, you'd never do it. So that's why this uh, Moz makes it sure it takes care of it for you. Um, it's a hundred bucks a year and I really wouldn't pay more than that for that service. But I mean, for, for additional features, a hundred bucks is fair and they take care of it for you. Or for the ones they can't do for you, they'll tell you how to do it, which is great. Accessibility. So this is frustrating. Um, you wanna make your website, oh, this should be April, 2019, I apologize. Your website should be as compliant as possible. And you can't be fully compliant with accessibility. And we're gonna talk about why and what to do. So the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is a law that was designed to make sure that people with disabilities can have the same access with people that don't. And what happens is, so for example, your office is a place of public accommodation, you have to make it accessible. But the question becomes, is a website a place of public accommodation? And so right now, the standards that exist right now are recommendations and not definitive standards. So, you know, Google has said, for example, do SSL, check. Google has said, verify your profile 100%, check. Google has said, uh, be mobile friendly, check. You know, A or B, on or off, true or false. And these are recommendations that the government has out there, but they're not definitive standards. Now, they were supposed to rule in 2008 about specifics, but of course they haven't. And the courts are split because some courts will say that your website, like your office, is a place of public accommodation, and others will say it isn't. And so the courts also haven't defined what constitutes an acceptable alternative. What if you have a visually impaired person and they can't read your website, and you say, you know what, I will, we will pick you up, we'll send a car, we'll send an Uber, and it will take you to our office and we will read you whatever pages you would like. Is that an accommodation? I think so. Or is it not? If someone is, you know, has a problem hearing, are you, and you're willing to, again, pick them up and bring them to your office and hire someone who can sign and sign them everything you want, is that an acceptable accommodation? I don't know. It sounds to me like it is, but again, when you're dealing with lawyers, unfortunately, it's a problem. And so lawyers are taking advantage of these ambiguities. And so what can you do? Well, a couple of things. You can defend yourself because uh, what's happening is the lawyers are basically saying, oh, dear Dr. Smith, uh, here's a demand letter that says, give me 
X thousands of dollars for my legal fees because my client, John Doe, has, is um, a visually impaired and your website doesn't render well on his screen reader. And so you can say, hey, you know what? First of all, these aren't standards that are set yet, so I can't be responsible. Or it's going to cost me 20 grand to be compliant and my marketing budget is 21 grand, so I can't do that. Or, you know, you can say that, it, you know, there, there's no law yet. This is not, you know, so you could do that. By the time you're done, it's going to cost you a ton of time and a ton of money to make your case, even though you may be right. So what we use, we use UserWay. UserWay, it's free. You just have to register for it to make changes to it, but it's free. We use it for all of our clients. And what it will do is it will basically make your website more accessible. It certainly won't make it accessible that it would pass an accessibility test. Again, because you can't. How can I give you a test if the questions and the answers are still up in the air? You know, there are some, you want to minimize your footprint and make yourself a smaller target. And you could certainly run your site through a checker and you're going to fall down when you see what, what they want you to do. If there are certain just levels of accessibility to be compliant that are just absolutely preposterous. Plus, in my opinion, in terms of, in terms of the practicality of getting them done. Um, you can aim for level AA if you really want to get into it. The truth is, I really would say just use UserWay. And again, they can't, it's not going to prevent you from getting a demand letter or having a problem, but it certainly will help in, again, making you a smaller target for that attorney, unfortunately, who's trying to do that. So just something to consider. I know for WordPress, that widget is free. You can just download it and install it, and it works. So um, yes, that's what we have for that. And oh, and the other thing is that when you look at some of them, some of these rules are ambiguous. It might say, well, if you're going to, um, you know, the highlights of the colors on the, um, on the links or whatever it is, they should be different whether or not what the intent is. And how are you going to define intent? I mean, that's really, you know, get, getting into the weeds compared to you mobile friendly, yes or no. So there we go. HIPAA. Okay. First of all, just because you're running a certain email program, that does not make your email HIPAA compliant. You know, oh, well, Microsoft Outlook is HIPAA compliant. No, it's not. Because <laughs> if you send an email in Microsoft Outlook that says, hi, patient, you know, the social security number is this, 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 and this, then certainly you violated HIPAA. So email itself is not, the program is not HIPAA compliant. And unfortunately, again, it's very difficult to figure out what HIPAA compliant means. But if you use a service that has HIPAA compliant email, that's something that will help you, especially if you are communicating, you know, as we do sometimes with other providers about patient information, it's got to be done in a way that protects everybody. There are basically programs where what you'll do is they're online. You will write an email and then the email goes to the server. And then the person who gets the email from you clicks the email, opens it up, logs in and sees the message. That way it stays secure. So um, don't accept socials on your website, please. Don't accept payments directly on your website for HIPAA and for PCI compliance. If you don't know what that is, you don't want to know what that is. That's the banks making sure that you're doing everything with security standards. You don't want to do that. Um, consider a third-party service to accept payments online. Um, I've worked with a couple of clients who do that, so let me know. Your bank can help you set one up. Um, even your credit card processor in the office probably has a third-party service. Let them handle that. Let them be responsible for security. You don't want to handle that. I promise you. Analytics. You have to have Google Analytics. So Google Analytics is a free tool, and it lets you track key performance indicators, KPIs, and every website should have it. And if you don't have it, ask your web developer. It takes three seconds for them to install it, and it's invaluable. And so the idea is, you know, sometimes I'll call it a magic eight ball, except the magic eight ball really is random. Google Analytics isn't. So you ask a question and look at analytics for the answer. So in this example, I might say to you, hey, we just paid lots of money for a social media campaign. Is it working? We're going to see here, well, and this, this is actual data, that from social, there were two visitors in this time period and zero. So, hey, the campaign isn't working. That's what analytics can tell you, among a million other things, but that's just scratching the surface. All right, so I want to talk about thinking about SEO in mind when we go developing. So SEO is the process by which we take research keywords, and put them in specific locations on your website. Let's just go through it. So 
specific keywords on specific web pages. So let's say dental implants. So we're gonna make a page about dental implants and we're gonna put specific keywords on dental implants and we're gonna research them, whether it's dental implants, Tribeca, New Jersey, implant dentist, Tribeca, New York, implant dentist, Tribeca, whatever it is. We're gonna research, which is the subject of another webinar, another topic, but we're going to take these specific keywords that we know are being searched and we're gonna put them on specific pages. We're gonna put, let's say, dental implants, Tribeca NY on our dental implants page because if most of the people are searching for dental implants, Tribeca NY, then there's a greater chance of my page being seen. So if you think about that, if the most common search term is dental implants, Tribeca New York, I wanna make sure that my website comes up when someone searches that. So I'm going to make my page about dental implants, Tribeca New York. So use the specific keywords on specific pages with the goal of appearing higher in search engine rankings, which of course you wanna drive more traffic and generate new patients. Now, there's organic search versus paid search. Organic search is based on the content. So if you have a web page about, if you wanna rank for Invisalign and you don't have an Invisalign page, but I have an Invisalign page, I'm gonna do better than you, of course, on that subject. So organic search is based on the content of your website and you can't pay more to have that done. So there you see organic search at the bottom. That was the search for used cars. Now, paid search, you create an ad and you pay when people click. AdWords, which is now Google Ads and Facebook Ads. But you can see here under paid search, on the top and on the right, that's where Google puts their, um, their paid ads. So you can see where they are. And again, obviously look, if this is a dentist over here, your Google's gonna know that if you're saying, oh, used cars, and it leads to a dental website about dental implants, Google's not gonna let that happen. And you can't just say, I'm willing to pay, you know, $100 a click for used cars to get to dental, it's not gonna let you do that. But these, these companies here are competing with each other about who has, who will pay more per click, and all sorts of factors go into ranking this, but money obviously does affect these, but it doesn't affect these, the organic listings. And again, for the organic ranking factors, we kind of know what they are. We talked about before. We have a clue, but we don't know what the relative weights are. So what search engine terminology makes a difference for you when it comes to building your site? So let's forget about paid for a second because that's paid. Organic. There is on-site SEO and off-site. On-site SEO, those are things that you can do on your website when you're building it that can help you, match, you know, be in compliance with those ranking factors. And off-site factors are things that are not done on your site that you can still do to help with ranking factors. So one of them is the HTML code, how your page is laid out, what keywords you use. If you have a keyword dentist who goes to the gym, who works in Tribeca, who does dental implants in Tribeca but lives in New Jersey, that's me, that's probably not going to, you know, no one's searching for that. It doesn't really matter. So um, and then site speed, off-site, link building, we're going to talk about that. How old is your domain name? Register your name for 10 years because then it shows Google that you're committed in the long haul. Will that make a huge difference? What if I'm a startup? Of course not. But when you put all those factors together, you know, I don't know the relative weight, but it all adds up. And hosting location. Try and host your website in the same country that you have your, um, that, that, that your, your practices. Okay, so on-site SEO. This you can you know, give to your web developer if this doesn't make any sense to you, which is fine. But you want a title tag on every page, properly formatted pages and posts, fast speed, pass Google's mobile friendly test. Please, 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 I cannot tell you of the sites that I see, number two is not done the right way all, way too frequently. And I'm called in to do SEO audits and to do evaluations. And these are simple things that people said, oh, they're doing SEO for me. But the, the pages isn't formatted properly. The pages aren't formatted properly. So that's, that's really, really big. Same thing, verify your Google My Business profile, please. Page text is probably closer to 2250 these days. Use alt tags and have a well-researched focus keyword for the page. Again, I've seen it where they're quote unquote doing SEO and the page says implants. That's, you know, Dr. Wank does implants and da 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 da, you know, we do also. That's not an optimized page. So understand, you know, the optimized page would look more like that page that I showed you before, 
uh, let me, what I showed you before where I said, here's a list on the left of you know, four topics on one page, and the other one was all about implants. Let's say the keywords are, the keyword is implant dentist Tribeca. And you might say, so the title of the page would be implant dentist Tribeca. Dr. Wank is an implant dentist in Tribeca, and he's accepting new patients. Dental implants. Implants are great because they do this and this and this and this. Uh, what about the cost of implants? Blah, 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 blah. It's all about implants. And so when I see a page that's quote unquote been optimized and it just says implants, no, it's not optimized. Offsite. Make sure you register the name in your name, please. Please. Um, host it in your country where your practice is and grab the low hanging fruit links that we will talk about. Now, when it comes to ranking factors, it's all about competition. And if there's less competition, it's easier. So if you're in trying to rank for dental implants in Billings, Montana, and let's say you're the only dentist with a page on that subject, you'll rank. Even if your page is slow and this and that and really fails on other ranking factors, you'll still rank because Google's gonna, you know, you're gonna hold your nose and vote for one candidate over the other because whatever reason, well, Google will hold its nose and give the best page it has. If you go to the library and ask for a book about glassware and the only book they have is a ratty old book that's water stained with a broken binder. They're not going to say, oh, no, none for you. They're going to say, okay, we have this ratty old book, but it's the best we have, but we'll give it to you. So your website with two competitors, let's say, or whatever it is. Now, let's say your dental implants, Los Angeles, and believe me, 20 competitors doesn't even scratch the surface. It's really hard to rank, you know, your website with a bunch of competitors. So the reason why I want you making your page stand out with the other ranking factors is because, again, how does Google differentiate among all the others? This was from an old lecture, the presidential thing. Forget about that. But how does it differentiate? Well, it's going to look at these factors. If all of you have, look, it's, it's not hard to figure out, you know, what people are searching for, let's say, in LA for implants. LA is kind of broad. But let's say here in New Jersey, I said, dental implant, Short Hills, New Jersey. It's very easy to figure out that's the keyword. So now 10 dentists in Short Hills have that. Did they all, whoops, did they all fill out their profile? Do they all have accurate name, address, phone number? Do they all have, you know, um, alt tags? So again, if you do what you're supposed to do, you put yourself in a position to do well. Okay, so again, forgive me the PowerPoint conversion. This is my favorite quote from myself. What you hear about Google changing its ranking algorithm is mostly irrelevant. Keep publishing new quality on top of content and you will do well. Google algorithm changes really only help people who are trying to screw the system and you game the system. If you are writing quality content or you have quality content, you're buying quality content, you're not doing um, keyword stuffing where you say, Dr. Wank is an implant dentist in Tribeca, New York, who loves doing implants in Tribeca, New York, because Tribeca, New York is a great place for implants. That's keyword stuffing. Or you'd see like, for example, at the bottom of a page, we serve clients in, uh, you know, Maplewood, Milliburn, Short Hills, Chatham, Madison, South Orange. You know, no, that's keyword stuffing. Don't do that. Link building. Now, one of the other things that helps Google differentiate you from your competitors is who links to you. Now, it is a, um, it's a popularity contest. And so the problem is, is that, let's say I'm a dentist in Maplewood, New Jersey, and you're a dentist in Maplewood, New Jersey. And we've done everything well, we're up to standards and the whole thing. One of the things Google will look at is, well, who links to you? Why? Well, because if someone links to your website, there must be something of value there. And so, again, if you were the captain of the football team or you're friends with the captain of the football team, you're gonna be cool by extension. And maybe your brother will be cool or your sister will be cool as well. But your brother's friend's brother's brother's friend's friend from another school, it's gonna wear out by that. It doesn't matter that the captain of the football team, another town is their friend it trickles down. So, but one thing that Google does look at is who links to you. Now, the problem is getting links um, because getting links is like dating that, you know, links are really given, people don't just give away links because again, you are giving away a certain, um, you're endorsing it at some level. If I send a link to your website, I'm endorsing it. Now, there are ways to set it so it doesn't actually give this link juice you see on the screen. But in general, I don't want to link to any website that is not something that I, that I like. You know, if I want to send my, my patients to an endodontist um, and that endodontist website is hideous, even if it's the best endodontist in the whole world, I don't, want to, I don't want to link there. So 
The idea, though, is that one of the ranking factors is who links to you. And again, if someone like the, um, if the, you teach at the dental school locally and the school links to you, that's a much more valuable link than your, um, your exterminator, you know, says, you know, we do exterminating, by the way, you know, and the exterminator makes more than you do, but <laughs> we're the exterminator. And at the bottom, my friend, Dr. David Wank is a great implant dentist and links to my website, you know, that, to, you know, dental website, that link is a great link, but it's not nearly as good as a link from, you know, the ADA, which you're not going to get, but at least, or from, for example, the dental school, your bio page. So what I would tell you to do is get the, the easy links, the low-hanging fruit. Now, when you link somewhere, you can actually link, and then you can link and say, you know, give some credit. But I wouldn't worry about that as much now. What I would do is, so for example, on the ADA, you know, if you have a profile on the ADA website, you're a member, fill out the profile, have them link to you. AGD, if you're a member of a specialty organization, local chamber of commerce, if it's 200 bucks a year and they'll link to your website, get it. I used to have, well, and a client used to volunteer. Um, they would do work for the church and the church linked to them. Now, is that a powerful link? Well, in the sense for social proof, it certainly is. But, you know, is the link from the church going to give you the same uh, authority that, for example, one of my clients who, when he opened his office, the news station came and did a whole, oh my goodness, there's a new dentist in town. Certainly from the news organization, that's a better link, right? You know, a news organization has a much higher level of quality, let's say, than a local church. And I don't mean quality in terms of what's on it, in terms of popularity. Um, newspaper print articles. You know, if you wrote an article in the local you know, mother's journal, you're a pediatric dentist about nursing bottle carries, and they have an online version that links to you, then that's great. So again, it's, you could have big links. You know, let's say you got an article in, um, in the dental journal or something like that, and they link to you, fantastic. But it might also be just as good if you had all of these links, for example. Um, now, watch out for link building services, please. Here's the problem. Because like I said, uh, if people come to me all the time, you know, hey, Dr. Wank, we see on Short Health Design, you have this great article. We think your, your users would love to see this uh, infographic. So we'll give you some money and put the link on your website to our website. So that way, you know, they go to, let's say, some article I wrote about content writing. And then they want me to link to them. Well, first of all, I don't want to link to them because I want to keep my traffic on my website, number one. Number two, let's say they paid me. So here's, you know, a million dollars. Okay, so fine. I still have a relationship with them. But let's say I'm going to do that for you. Let's say I said to them, you know what? They're doing it for you. They said, David, you know, you wrote such a great article about uh, the design of a web page. Here's our client, Dr. Smith, Dr. Jones. We're going to give you $1,000 a month and have your article linked to his website. That'd be great for that dentist. Here's the problem. That agreement in theory, first of all, you really shouldn't be paying for links. That's kind of sketchy. But let's say you did. And you paid that person and that person convinced me to link to you. What's to say that I decide later on, you know what? I don't want to link to you anymore. Or someone else came along and is going to give me $1,100 a month or $2,000 a month for that same link. So you've got to have something in writing or some kind of agreement with whoever you're doing link building with that says, listen, you'll get the links for me. However, and I'm going to pay you this to secure those links. But what guarantee do I have that A, those links are going to be there tomorrow or in a month? How long are they going to stay there? And what happens if they stop linking to me? The other problem with link building services is that there's only so much that you can, you can do because it's all based on connection. So think of it like a sports car dealership or a rental car. They've got one Porsche. They've got one Mercedes. You know, they have one SUV and the rest are compact cars. So the first person comes along is willing to pay. They have the Porsche. Next person gets the Mercedes. Past that, you've only have the compact cars available. Now, is that still worth a thousand bucks a month for the compact cars? Probably not. Maybe 200 a month. So, you know, well, but if I'm willing to pay more, can I get the portion now? Can you bring it back from someone else? So if you're going to do link building, someone else is establishing a relationship for you and you don't control that relationship. So that is just, I'd be very careful. You get something about that in writing. So at least, you know, if that link disappears, then either you're getting it, you're getting some money back or something's going to happen. So that's about link building. I have an entire webinar from, I think it was March or April of 18. If you're interested in looking, it's online. Reviews. 
let me be the first to tell you I hate reviews. I think it's not fair. I think it just really puts us as healthcare practitioners in a terrible position because, you know, like when you go to Amazon and I always look at the one-star reviews and there's always a one-star review that says, this is the best, um, best headset I've ever had, but the package was dented one star, you know, which has nothing to do with the fact that it's, a, it's the headphones. So take it with a grain of salt. Now, the review sections have changed since they did this with the number and the stars. Most of us or most of you are going to have a, a service, whether it's, and again, I don't endorse any of them. You know, Solution Reach, which is Smile Reminder, um, Demand Force, Bird Eye, that are going to help you curate reviews. And the overall idea is that, A, they're going to send emails to your patients afterwards and say, hey, I hope you had a great time. Leave us a review. And if the review is a five or a four, they'll keep it. If the review is a two, three, two, or one, they'll send it to you and not publish it. So that's something to think about. But reviews are good. Again, because people look at reviews. And again, if you have a bad review, it's not horrible. You're looking for consistency. I mean, here, 168, 4.7 stars. I'm pretty happy with that. You know, five, 3.4, I don't know, eight, 4.7s. You know, 171 and it's three and a half. They're very average. And that's okay. But again, reviews are important because how do people judge you? They don't know how to. They can't read your bite wings. So that's, and if you don't hurt them. Now, when you get a bad review, first figure out why. Are you looking out the window or are you looking in the mirror? I once was asked to consult for somebody who had really bad reviews. And he said to me, yeah, those are true. <laughs> and I said, okay, well then, you know, you need to be nicer. <laughs> that's the long and the short of it. But if you really are mean and you hurt people and your front desk is, is, is not nice, that's going to come out in your reviews. And, you know, those are true. So don't, you know, so change your ways. In terms of looking in the mirror, that's the mirror. Looking out the window is you have a patient who you have a tooth number two that's plus three mobile with a nine millimeter pocket. They begged you to do the endo and the crown. You said yes. You told them this is the poor prognosis. It won't last a week and it's depressible. And you wrote a note and they signed the note and they understood the, the whole thing. Now, 10 years later, that tooth fails. You know, heroics on your part. And the patient writes a review. Well, my tooth number two fell out because doctors such and such did a crappy job. And you want to lose your mind. And I agree with you, especially because, you know, it, it was heroic. You told the patient it was a problem. The patient signed on that. The problem is, is that there's nothing you can do about that. You don't reply to it. Outcompete it with other content, other reviews. Um, and if you have to reply, you can say, you know, we want everyone in, you know, such and such smiles to have a great experience. Please contact us and we'll be happy to speak with you, you know, personally about your concerns, period. So at least you're looking like you reply. You're not ignoring it. But again, if you do reply, watch out for HIPAA, please, please, please. Because if you patient writes, you told me tooth number two was only going to last a year and it lasted 10 years. I wanted 11 years. You're the worst. And you write back, that tooth number two was, had a poor prognosis. Oh, HIPAA violation. And I was lecturing last week and someone said, if the person brings up the issue, can you reply? Kind of like in court. Well, you know, we're not going to do, a, I was watching a show, you know, you're not allowed to enter the thing about the, whatever it is, you know, the stereo. But then when they question the witness, the witness brings up the stereo. Okay, now it all comes in. Same thing. Just because the patient says, I had a root canal on number two, that doesn't mean you can talk about the root canal on number two. Um, maybe it does, but I wouldn't. I'd be very careful. So. I want you to maintain perspective. I'm sorry this got cut off, but I love this quote. And it says, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. So wrapping up, maintenance. Define what maintenance is with your provider, please. So for us, to give you an example, WordPress lives online, so it requires, you've got to update it you know, once a month we check, let's say, to make sure the WordPress software is up to date and to make sure that the, um, the plugins are up to date. That's, a so that's part of the software. Uh, maintenance is a separate issue. Maintenance is, uh, David, can you please update this picture? Or David, can you swap this out or add this page? These are certain things that you can do yourself if you wanted to. It's WordPress, right? Um, but some of our clients choose not to. So again, for us, maintenance is specific work, adding things, changing things, doing what we have to do on the website. 
whereas updates are the WordPress updates. And for example, our WordPress updates are included in our hosting packages. So people don't have to worry about that. You know, if you want to, you can do your own updates. The hardest part of doing WordPress updates is remembering to do them. But I just want you to understand that if they say, oh, it comes with maintenance, well, does that mean they're going to keep WordPress up to date? What does that mean? You get an hour of time a month of free changes. Or what does that mean? Please make sure you clarify that with um, whoever you're working with. And also, please make sure you get an agreement. Make sure you have it in writing. Make sure all this licensing stuff is in writing. It's really, really important because you will, unfortunately, if you have a problem, you're in trouble without anything in writing. Miscellaneous. Um, make sure that you have a backup of your website. Now, when you ask your web company for a backup of, their, of your website, it's kind of like when they ask us for x-rays. And you can say, I was at a CE where a very smart guy from Harvard told me that I need to have a backup. I'm just a dentist. I'm just doing what I'm told. But not everyone can give you a backup. If you have a question, ask me. Email me or you know, ask on the, uh, the Facebook group or, or tweet. But if you, if you have a WordPress website, there's no reason not to have your own backup. And make sure that you or your web provider is taking care of monthly updates just for security. Um, WordPress is huge on the internet and people, of course, jerks out there want to sabotage people's websites. And as long as you keep your installation up to date, which is easy, um, it should really protect you generally. Um, and if you want, I mean, I, we use iTheme security. It's free, the free version, not the pro version for all of our clients and knock on, you know, whatever it is, we really, gosh, we haven't had a hack, you know, malware in, a very, very long time, but I won't say that out loud because I don't want to jinx it. But certainly you can ask me about that if you have questions. Here is just a slide I threw in because we have an extra second that I want to show you that your website is the center of your marketing universe and the goal is to drive traffic. So through organic SEO, content and content marketing, PPC, AdWords, Facebook ads, social media, all of that to get people to your website, to generate new leads, to hopefully become new patients. You can throw in here, you know, our lead generation efforts with, excuse me, our lead generation efforts with Treatment Magnet, where we use lead magnets or Enamel, our web bot and your website. It's all lead generation to get you new patients. And I thank you so much for your time. Here's my contact information. Uh, you can email me, uh, contact form on the website. You can call me and I will get back to you. It might take me, I get a ton of email. So please, you know, if it takes me a day or two, I, I will get back to you. Um, again, thank you for staying. You will get your CE credits. Um, if you have any questions, we're going to, again, email them to you or mail them to you. If we have your email, we'll email them to you. If you have any questions about them, though, please let me know. You can email me here at this email address. If you want to copy the slides, let me know. And I think we are done for this evening. So thank you all again for your time. Have a wonderful night. And thanks again. Hope to see you next time.